you know, I was trapped under the ground for, for basically, you know, over 55 hours and was lucky to, to be rescued. Could have easily not been rescued. Could have died at that moment or could have not been rescued. See you. I can see me. I'll be the eyes so that I just can be. This is another episode of a special series called Enough for All of the podcast Walk, Talk, Listen. This series sheds light on 75 years of an NGO called CWS. My name is Moritz Blum and I welcome you to another episode of Walk, Talk, Listen. Okay, good day, everybody. This is uh, another episode of the podcast Walk, Talk, Listen, actually, but of the special series about uh, an organization called CWS. And this is the second time that I will talk with the president and CEO of CWS. Um, But just in case you did not hear the first episode, although I think you should check it out because I think it contains an interesting conversation as well. Um, You know, I will ask Rick uh, to introduce himself. Yeah, thanks, Maurice. Thanks for having me on for part two. I, I figure people, if they could, if they could stand part one, <laughs> then we'll be okay for part two. Um, so yeah, Rick Santos. I'm uh, the current president and CEO of Church World Service. Um, my background, just really briefly again, is um, I spent probably uh, over 25 years uh, doing international development, relief and development work. I spent a decade in Asia at one point in my career, kind of broken up into two pieces. Um, uh, but seven of those years with Church World Service. Um, I, I was with CWS very earlier part of my career, and then I went on to work for two other organizations. Uh, the last one prior to CWS was a group called IMA World Health, and we were a, a faith-based public health organization doing a lot of really interesting uh, work. And yeah, so that's who I am. And back from my second stint uh, on Walk, Walk, Talk, Listen, and with Church World Service. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's great uh, having you. I, you know, before, um, you know, just for the listeners, what we are trying to do is uh, today is maybe you know talk a little bit about the present and in the future. While I think the first conversation was more looking back, um, you know. But before I start with my question, I did not ask you this in the beginning, but I, I would like to hear, um, you know, when you were listening to our conversation, was there something that, uh, you know, said, oh, this is, this is interesting that we talked about this, or this is interesting that I reacted around this. Is there, is there anything that... that uh, yeah, so know, in the first conversation, I really appreciated um, the, the, the fact that you and I um, overlapped in our careers in uh, mm-hmm. Bangladesh, and 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 that conversation around um, the local partner that we both were working for at the time, CCDB, and uh, the around the leadership and and kind of weaving that into the larger conversation of localization. Um, uh, yeah, I thought that was just it just brought back a lot of memories mm-hmm. of that time in Bangladesh. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, and and just for the for the listeners, so Rick, Rick for for quite a while would come to my house and pick me up to, to, uh, so that we could drive carpool to, to get out to the office. And I'm not very good in the morning. So he drank a lot of coffee, <laughs> cup of coffee. <laughs> and I'm not a very good driver. So <laughs> it all even down. <laughs> I think I, I think I put like a couple of dents in the tree in your yard uh, when I parked the car. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's good that this is a, a podcast and not a video. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot is happening in, in, in the world today. If I talk with you about, you know, our sector of the NGO uh, sector, you know, faith-based organizations trying to, you know, contribute to make this world a little bit better, um, what do you see? What's happening? So thanks, Mark. It's a great question. I, I, you know, so much is happening. Um, And we can look at it from a lot of different angles. Um, 
maybe just one angle we can just talk about just like literally what's happening uh, today uh, with Ukraine. Um, and then for in the US, of course, we had the Afghan evacuation and the refugee resettlement here in the US this year. So really, I would say two very, uh, for us as an organization, two very unexpected, very intense kind of challenges that we had to face. So, so I would say um, maybe that, so two pieces to that one. The first is I think the unpredictability in our world is much higher than even it was a decade ago, and certainly higher than when you and I were living overseas uh, over two decades ago. Um, just the volatility, um, whether it be with um, natural disasters, uh, 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 complex emergencies, um, even the development conversation, I think, is, is more complex these days. Um, and, and things change really rapidly. So, you know, f you know, I think, for example, the, the Russian attack on Ukraine has really changed the, essentially the European world order, um, not let alone the whole world order. Mm. Um, and so we have to think about what, what does that mean? So on the other hand, I would say the organizations that are able to respond to have the flexibility that build in a calculus that includes uh, the fact that there's a lot of unpredictability in, in the world today will be actually organizations more likely to succeed. So, so there's a lot of other, other kind of, I would say, trends around uh, nonprofits or international nonprofits. Um, you know, I saw some data maybe a couple of years back around this idea that, that there's a lot of NGOs being started. So I think there's like thousands of NGOs, uh, like in maybe in a year getting created, there's tens of thousands of them. There are a lot of them are very, very small. So on the small side, you see this kind of proliferation, very maybe single issue focus. And then you see also on the top side, uh, a concentration, right? So you see the larger ones are getting really big and that the work that they do, the, the work, at least some of the, let's say the restricted dollars through the public donor sector um, going to fewer and fewer organizations on the top. And then there's like groups like us, which I would say are in the middle and, and essentially we're getting squeezed from both sides. So we're in a, in a kind of a competitive stance. Um, and I use that word kind of, you know, not that we're competing against them day to day or anything like that, but in fact, for example, a lot of the smaller ones are going after individual donor dollars, which is what we also go after. So there's a there's a kind of a pull, of, you know, on that side. On the on the bigger side, you know, the larger and larger awards going to fewer and fewer organizations makes it co more competitive on the public donor award side. So so organizations like uh, Church World Service um, were kind of in the middle. And we've got to really be agile and we really have to have, um, I would say, no, really know what our competitive advantages are. Um, that being said, all to the service of mission. And, and I would say maybe a key part of that is really understanding what our mission is and who we are and what we're trying to do in the world. I think that, of course, creates a, a, a huge advantage if we, we have that, if we're not jumping around, whether we're really clear about, about what's core to our mission and what we're trying to get done in the world. So I would say, so, so there's so many different things, um, I would say, in the external environment um, that are in flux in ways that I don't think we've seen previous. Great. And I hear some of our listeners, you know, asking uh, themselves the question, so what is the mission of, of CWS? Yeah, so so you know, I, I would just say for me, it's always I always give the the abridged version. Uh, we are committed, and we serve vulnerable people in the areas of hunger, poverty, displacement, and disaster. Now we could drill down on those three pieces, um, and uh, and talk really in depth about each of them. But I would say that's our core mission. And so to me, the the critical pieces are, and I and I would. Let's add the, 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 the how is we work in partnership. We believe in the, the idea that we can do more together. And that was actually a founding principle. Like those three areas were actually the founding three areas of church world mm -hmm. service. And we were founded by 17 uh, Protestant churches who came together post-World War II to say, felt that they, they could achieve more in, in helping Europe and Asia post-World War II by coming together. 
So that's a that's a founding principle. And I think, the, you know, 75 years later, that's just an incredibly strong principle. It still works for us today. It's still a core part of who we are. And those core legacies around hunger and poverty, uh, displacement and disaster are still core to our work. And if we look at the external environment, uh, and I, I'll add the, the population of vulnerable populations, if you look to, to the external environment, all of those are increasing. Like just now with the war, the, the situation with grain coming out of Russia and Ukraine is going to create a, a lot of um, food insecurity in places like the Horn of Africa. Um, it, it's created incredible displacement, and it's created um, this essentially a need for an emergency response. So those three areas are absolutely as relevant as they were. Mm -hmm. um, we have to figure out our niche within each of those and, and also you know, figuring out who, who we want to partner with as we try to do more together. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit about, I think, our, our core mission and, and how it's playing out today. And, and then, Rick, um, can you, you know, when I'm listening to you, so, so partnership is extremely important, you said, uh, for CWS, working with local organizations, with, yeah. with other types of organizations. So how, how does that work then in terms of, you know, our competitors? How does, you know, competition goes with partnership? Can, can you explain that to, for the listeners? So I think there's a lot of ways to partner. And I think um, we, we want to partner in a way that will strengthen our local partners and that will make sure we, we have the, the impact on the, the, the local populations, the positive impact that we're hoping to achieve. Um, so part of that partnership is around, I would say, simply as, uh, uh, so from the start of the process to the end, so design. Right, so we we work together with a local partner or another partner, and as we think about what needs to be done, also with the community, right? So that so that level of design has those three pieces to that. Mm -hmm. um, I think an, another kind of approach that we have is it, it magnifies. I, I really feel that working through partnerships actually magnifies the impact because we have a better sense of what's going on on the ground than uh, many of our of our quote unquote competitors. Um, and third, you know, the interesting thing for me is uh, we've been doing this for about 40 years, maybe 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. working with local partners. So I'll just give you a perfect example. I was having this conversation with somebody from USAID uh, literally about, about a month ago. And I said, you know, th there's a group of Christian health associations all across Africa, for example. And these are, are networks of uh, Christian hospitals, clinics. Um, and, and faith uh, churches and faith institutions across the country. Uh, and there's about 26 of them and or more now um, in these in, 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 in the in the sub-Saharan Africa region. And what's so interesting about that is that whole thing is a localization project, right? That in fact USAID is partnering with a these localized partners that we as the US churches localized 30, 40 years ago hmm. and quite successfully. And so so the ability to say we have a track record, we know how to do it, um, which includes, you know, turning over a certain amount of power, uh, resources, and, and control to the local partners, but also ensuring integrity of the funds, uh, making sure the integrity of, of the interventions and things like that. Um, so, so I think, you know, from my perspective, organizations, especially more secular ones or the, the for-profit development agencies, they don't have that model. They've never had that model. Their model has always been heavy footprint um, uh, and parallel systems, right? Right. So I, I just don't think, so I think there is a competitive advantage there. And I think the time is right for us actually to, to utilize that. Hmm. Great. Um, let, let us continue to talk a little bit about you know this changing landscape um you know in in our sector um i i for me what is interesting is is uh and i think also important for our listeners to to understand is that the biggest ngo out there is BRAC, right or right. one of the biggest right, right. And which biggest. is a which is a bangladeshi ngo when, when you and i were working in bangladesh that was not the case right so that's that is one thing that's that's happening. 
Um, and the other thing is, is uh, you know, the private sector is coming closer and closer to uh, to our sector and there are collaborations, you have the B Corps. So what do you think if, you know, you kind of think about the future of the work that needs to be done? So that means from my perspective, having an impact, you know, in uh, ensuring that we reach the sustainable development goals as a world. Um, you know, what do you see happening in our sector? What type of collaborations do you see? Um, and I know it's maybe, you know, the million dollar question, if you have the answers, but, but still let, let us, let us, uh, yeah, share a little bit of your, of your thoughts. Yeah. I, I you know, I, I, I agree. I think that's another one of the trends that that's in our sector is we, we saw, I would say there's two different modalities from the private sector. There's probably three in the U S this, the rest of the world doesn't have like the for-profit development sector, like we do with those large for-profit development agencies mm -hmm. who shall go nameless. Um, but the, the idea of, of kind of business, social good businesses. Um, and also I would say the other kind of trend that we see is really the, the rise of kind of really these mega foundations like Bill and Melinda Gates um, and so forth that, that there's more, there's a lot of private resources out there entering the, the kind of the market in a different way. I know, for example, in my time serving on the Gavi Civil Society Committee, that when you saw the, you know, Gavi's budget, uh, and Gavi is the Vaccine Alliance uh, based in Geneva, uh, they, you know, received a significant amount uh, from uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, almost as much as a lot of countries. Um, so, so, so this is a this is also impacting how we think about about development. Uh, the, the 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 private sector is to me really interesting. I think, in kind of the most visible way, about a decade ago was Tom Shoes, and so you know you know the guy who created Tom Shoes was like basically he he created himself the chief giving officer, um, and so just this idea that you know they were basically building the shoe for 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 sale. And then they were um, then they were giving away a pair of shoe for every pair of shoes that they sold, and you know uh, so there's uh, some pieces to that I think that worked really well. Some challenges to that model as well, especially on the GIK side, where, you know GIK shipping and so forth, as opposed to local um, uh, sourcing locally. But in fact, the idea was I think really I think opening up this whole idea of B Corp and what does it mean to be a social good institution and and how do we build. Uh, you know, how do we address kind of issues from the private sector? I'll give you another example. There's a group that that I worked with um, when I was at IMA in uh, Kenya called Sanergy. And they had this really kind of small for-profit company that was doing kind of really interesting things with essentially latrines, um, uh, being able to, to manage the waste. And, and these were in really kind of, I would say, dense, very poor um, kind of slum areas. And then using that that to like essentially uh, build, uh, flies, you know, you had this kind of fly that was created, and then that was used as feed. And so there's like they were able to like look at the, the essentially human waste and figure out a business model of how to make money off of it, and also create um, and, and then provide latrines and other things for 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 areas that were lacking them. So I think there's some really innovative things on on the private sector side that I think need to be explored. So for nonprofits, I think, I think there's probably two questions that as, as, as nonprofits we have to ask ourselves. Like the first is um, how do we partner with these types of organizations? Like what makes it easier for them to partner with us and, and vice versa? Because the, 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 the calculus sometimes is very different. The second thing is, do, do, is this uh, kind of the, the call to the nonprofit world to like start becoming more entrepreneurial? in terms of the for-profit sector, you know, like, like you, you mentioned Grameen and like all of the big ones, Brack, Grameen and Prashika all went into the business and, you know, like Grameen phones, uh, Grameen Shakti, which was their kind of electric thing there, you know, there's a lot of different, you know, and they became a really kind of a hybrid nonprofit for-profit. Um, and I, I'm sure they had different business models within the larger umbrella. So, you know, I, I'm not sure if many nonprofits are cut out for that, but I think, the, I, but I think the question is, has to be explored. And, and within that exploration, what, what do you think is the, is one of the biggest challenges for, for CWS? For CWS, I mean, I think 
you know, I think the business culture and the nonprofit culture are very different. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's a culture challenge. You know, I think if we, we look back to, to, um, to microcredit, and I think we actually talked about this in the first, first podcast a little bit, but what you saw was nonprofits getting out of it because they didn't, they weren't banks. They didn't know how to run like a bank. And in fact, a lot of the nonprofit work went to essentially larger NGOs that could kind of create the, the, the a kind of a banking approach and to banks, right? So there was the the OICU, uh, the OICU credit, which was, so these kind of credit, large credit things, I know CARE, for example, built that up and spun it off, right? So 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 there were so, some opportunities. So, so for CWS, the, the question is, you know, does it fit our mission? Does it help move uh, what we're trying to do uh, further down the field? And, um, you know, and, and can we build an infrastructure that won't kind of distract us from our core, from the current core work right now? Um, I'm not worried about competing with the current core work. I'm just worried about distracting from it um, mm -hmm. because then you get maybe too diffuse and then you, you're, then you're, you're doing too many things and not doing anything well. So maybe that's the other piece for us. It's like, we have, if we're going to go into this area, how do we do it well? And what can we do well? And maybe, maybe at first it's just partnerships with for-profit entities that, that have like, like uh, goals and, and, and mission um, and, and take it step by step. Mm. And, and um, at present, does CWS have already you know, pilot projects looking into this or, or is it too early? So for me, I'm always looking. So mm -hmm. I'm always looking for partners. Mm -hmm. I, I know, I know um, uh, Empower is a, is a for-profit group that you've worked with. Um, and and they've supported us, um, and and maybe we can look for other ways of, of partnering with them. You know, I think there's um, well, actually, so in a really interesting way, I just visited um, this uh, about a month ago uh, three of our U.S. local offices: uh, the one in Durham, the one in uh, Harrisonburg, and most recently, about a week ago, the one in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And it was really fascinating to me how many connections those offices have for local businesses and so in fact the, the day i arrived somebody handed me a packet of coffee with the city of logo on it mm -hmm. and i'm like where did this come from and they're like it's a local it's a local roaster who loves what we do wants to help us and so i'm like oh that's fantastic you know yeah. you know are there other ways we can amplify this great work that they're doing and and they can amplify us so I think partnerships like that are, we, we actually, there are things I'm just, you know, just, we need to kind of get, I would say everybody together to make sure we know what they are. Um, the other thing was there's a group there um, uh, that was, that uh, does cookies. They do the, um, oh, now I'm totally blanking on the name. They're essentially the Dutch cookie with the caramel inside the flat mm -hmm. cookie and they make them in Lancaster. And actually that shop is called the candy store. And the candy store has this other shop in it where they make the cookies. And their goal is essentially to hire uh, refugee women. Mm. So they've actually been hiring refugee women to do all the work. It's like their first job when they get to the US, they're trained on how to work at a job. Um, they're also given layers of experience so they, uh, in terms of management. And then they, they can stay sometimes or they go on to other things, but, but it, it's, it was a really great idea. And so I'm like, wow, we're, we're so connected to this local business. And they're doing a product that that we could probably sell other places. Like, how can we help them, and how can we get the name out? So, I think there's a lot of really interesting um, things out there that we can we could tap into. Rick, I would like us to to go to a discussion that has been taking place for quite a while now within CWS. You know, our supporters. Um, are, are very faithful to us and um but they are you know on average um you know the older citizens <laughs> so we are looking for this younger uh, generation you know to uh to collaborate with with them and, and support and 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 that brings us quickly about around discussions around branding and i would like to pick out one one uh, part of that branding exercise and that is uh, looking at a possible name change because this younger generation has often, you know, challenges with the name church in it. And, you know, where research has shown that. Um, so, you, you know, I've asked this question to, you know, uh, John McCullough, to, to Rodney Page, you know, to export members. 
what what is your take on you know a possible name change and again for all the listeners not to to panic you know this is nothing that will happen if it happens it yeah. will happen tomorrow but i think it's an important discussion to have so so uh, yeah what, what is your at this moment what is your uh, opinion about that so i mean I, th- I i i okay so i get a couple of things one i get that as generations uh, uh grow older and they they want to do more work in the world they do it differently than their parents did and so we we absolutely have to be uh to understand that and, and try to figure out what what that looks like and how we can create a relationship with them um uh, the second thing is i i do know that the word church and church world service i i faced it when i was overseas i worked in for cws in two muslim and a buddhist country right mm-hmm. so so um you know knowing that um that 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 could be you know challenging and and also in different places because you know as soon as they hear the word church the the, the question isn't what are the good things that you're doing around hunger you know poverty displacement and disaster it's like mm-hmm. what are you really doing kind of like that kind of kind of cynical up question um and so so i so i understand that the word church can be a barrier but i also think it's a, it's a huge source of strength for us i mean we were this idea of you know, um, uh, coming together as churches to 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 help uh, Europe and Asia after World War II, that that the ch- our church community has been so progressive and instrumental in critical causes, whether it be civil rights over time or the Vietnam War. You know, the the, the U.S. Protestant churches that make up CBS were very vocal on, in, in both of those um, things. So it's an incredible source of strength as well. And so I, for me, it's like it's just how do we balance that that history and that incredible strength that we get from from being called church world service um with with the fact that in reality there are some ways of that that this may be a barrier in in a way to 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 kind of getting closer to and building relationship with a younger generation of folks so i did i I dodge the question perfectly yet or so so it's i mean it's a really hard question um uh, you know for me i think we have to take it in steps. So I, I feel that there's so much uh, equity from CWS brand equity that frankly, if if we just one day decided to say we're not church world service anymore or CWS anymore, that that all of a sudden people say, then who are you? Then when they yeah. see a new name, they don't understand all the things that went on. I think, you know, CWS or our church world service with our public donors or our known entity and quantity with those donors. Uh, so, for example, the work that we do with, you know, um, refugees and resettlement, as well as even with disasters and 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 development, the institutional owners have known us for seventy five years. So, 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 you know, what do we? So, there's a question of what we lose with the name change, and and what do we gain? So, for me, this maybe a step in the, in the direction of trying to explore this would be um you know setting up uh, uh something around a new brand but not getting rid of the old one like not just totally swapping out it in one go um and and see if that new um you know it could be you know in the us we have all, the nonprofit laws allow us to build you know we could start another nonprofit with a new brand and we could we could test that out um uh so there's a lot of ways to do that and mm-hmm um uh to because i think so i I think there's three things right Mm -hmm. so one is i think the younger generation or older generation they're bought into we can do more together than alone which is our one of our core principles they're bought into hunger poverty disaster and displacement right and they're bought into vulnerable people and if the only thing between them supporting us and not supporting us is our name then we have to figure out other ways to reach out to them um, uh, you know, I, I just feel like, okay, if they understood who we are and what we do, they would support us, um, regardless of our name. And so, you know, I, I think that's another thing to explore. Like, like, mm-hmm. um, I, I would say, so maybe I'll just add one more piece of this and I'll stop, you know, CWS has an incredible audience of people. Mm. And I don't even know if we've tapped that audience uh, in terms of creating multiple ways of relating to us. Um, uh, as, as thoroughly as we, we, we need to. Um, because I feel like we have this built-in group of people who already know us and love us. 
And, and if we, how do we create opportunities for them to really uh, support us more mm-hmm. and to be in relationship with us in different ways? And that to me is what, it's what's critical, I think. Um, yeah, so, so in terms of the brand, I think, I, think, you know, there's, I think there's a lot, it's a very complicated issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, but I understand really the, the, the conversation because there is a, you know, for some, for some people, there is a barrier when, when, they, mm-hmm. when they hear our name. Just to remind the listeners, um, I mean, one is, yes, we are focusing now on a name change, but the branding conversation is much bigger, as you alluded to as well. Yeah. Much more than, an, you know, possible name change or not. That's one. And second, um, you know, I've been part of many conversations. And what is also clear, and, and the board has made it very clear, is that, um, you know, CWS is not looking at being becoming a secular organization. It will continue to be a faith-based organization based in the in the principles um, that were there, you know, 75 years ago. So I, I think that's that's kind of important to understand um, as well. Um, talking about, you know, what CWS has always been about, um, and that is justice. And 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 I wanted to mm-hmm. go talk a little bit with you about about it. Um, you know, Black Lives Matter, racial injustice. Those are still, unfortunately, important topics that are not only going on in, in the U.S., but also in the rest of the world. Um, I, I know we said we would not look back, but I, I, I still want to ask a question <laughs> to you about uh, the past of CWS. So there are two questions around racial injustice. And one is, if you look back, uh, Rick, and, and uh, you know, part of those years you were working for us and you, there is a part where you're looking, you know, from outside inside. Um, how did CWS do around racial injustice in, in its 75 years of existence? That's one. And the second question around is, you know, what are some of the challenges now and, and in the future for, for our organization? Yeah, so 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 just I think I already mentioned I think two areas where CWS was very involved uh, was during the '60s and '70s, which was the Vietnam War mm-hmm. and the Civil Rights Movement, and um, and part of that connection we we have been connected to, you know, a grouping of around 36 Protestant denominations. Uh, part of that that relationship also was due to the fact that we were connected to something called the National Council of Churches USA, and there they really, um, I would say, uh, were in a, in a lot of ways kind of on the cutting edge of a lot of um, justice issues. So, so I would say we have this really long history steeped in 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 addressing justice justice issues wherever we see it or injustice wherever we see it. And so, you know, I, I think that's still part of who we are. And, you know, the, 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 the programmatic work that we do um, is, is uh, I, I think, at its core, addresses justice issues, right? So if we're talking about hunger, um, so I think that maybe the other thing that people really don't know about CWS is CWS actually is both an international organization, and we have been, that was why we were created, We've also had a, a domestic footprint, a pretty significant domestic put, footprint for years. And so that domestic footprint has been around hunger issues. And, you know, hunger breaks down, you know, if you look at the data on hunger, like the, 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 the overwhelming amount of, of people of uh, color uh, who are hungry uh, in term, versus those who are, are white is, is, is pretty staggering. And so, you know, so even addressing hunger is addressing racial uh, disparity. Um, we, we do work with, you know, um, refugees. And so in the U.S., as well as we do domestic disaster. And we find with both of those, right, it's the vulnerable communities that are most kind of affected by um, especially disasters. Um, and, and that CBS is there to, to work with them. So I, I, so in our programmatic work, I see us addressing that. Um, and, but I think that the critical thing for, for me is around policy. So, so for us to be, uh, I would say, to really address the issues of, of injustice, um, the policy realm is really important, whether that be uh, state or local government 
or or national government. And um, and so you know we we continue to advocate. I think for for pro uh, pro justice policies across the spectrum. Um, and I think that's that's a really important part, and we will continue to do that. And, and, you know, recently we, we played an active role also in, in the ecumenical uh, efficacy days, right, yeah. where uh, there was a lot of push in, around, uh, you know, ensuring voting rights for all. So, so uh, I think that's, that's an important aspect as well. Uh, Rick, um, a lot of organizations are also, you know, looking at diversity, equity and inclusion mm -hmm. issues. How is that within CWS? We, we as well. I mean, I think there's two things. One, uh, prior to my coming, um, uh, there was um, a, a racial justice statement that was created, which I support and which I think is really good. And, and we reference it as an organization. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, as an organization, I think a lot of international development agencies have, we talk about kind of injustice or problems we're trying to address overseas, um, but, but not always look closely at, at kind of who we are as well. Um, so I think DEI is a really important um, process. And so as CWS, we've, we engaged a, a, a consultant team called the Ivy Group, um, and they did an assessment for us and help us create a plan. We've hired a director. So I think we're, we're taking all the right steps. We, we've looked at kind of uh, collaborative, like interaction has like a kind of a, a DEI compact. So we've looked at things like that, where we've kind of said, we're going to hold ourselves accountable to these, to the, to this type of, um, of scrutiny. Um, so I think we're, we're taking, doing all the right things that we need to do. And, and, you know, it's one of these things, it's, it's a process. We, we want, we want to make sure we're moving in the right direction. I, I mean, one of the things I was really proud about at IMA World Health when I was there, and I'm also really proud uh, here at CWS is our, our boards. So there, there. It's a very diverse board. Um, I, 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 the intentionality that went into that was really, I think, really strong, um, and I think that's helpful to us as we move forward in this conversation. Fighting inequity is also part, of course, of, of uh, the sustainable development goals. Um, you know, if if uh, if I ask you, what do you like the listeners to know about the sustainable development goals? You know, what would you like to lift up? <laughs> well, so I, I would say for me, what's so interesting to me about the SDGs. So, so maybe we can, uh, sorry, I hate to do the look back, look forward, but if we look at the MDGs, right, the Millennium mm -hmm. Development Goals, those were really, it was like really the first time that the international community had kind of came together and said, here are the things that we're going to, we're going to look at. And, and I think they were really based on, I would say, I would say the strong, um, uh, strong constituencies. Like, for example, there was, uh, there's only 15 of them, right? And one of them was devoted to HIV and AIDS. And so not, I'm not saying, I'm not going to say whether that's good or bad, but it was interesting that one, one very specific type of health intervention was identified versus other very specific types of health interventions. So, so, so the SD, so fast forward to the SDGs, um, I think that that process, I think, was much more, I would say, equitable in terms of ensuring the different, all the different areas of need were, were taken into consideration. And, and so by doing that, I think they created a much more, I would say, kind of better integrated a set of, of goals for the international community. What's, what's interesting to me with the SDGs now is they're, how interconnected they all are. And that that really, you know, frankly, you can't you can't you can't get make progress in one if you're not making progress in multiple, if not all. And so, you know, for example, we'll take the health goal, right? There's a water goal, there's a health goal, there's an ag goal. All those three are connected, right? So, so, so you have to make progress on all three, or you're not going to make the progress you need to make on any one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I you know I, I think COVID also has shown you know Luke yeah. told us that that we are we are all interconnected and that yeah. all these issues are interconnected as well. Unfortunately, you know it it seems sometimes that we you know quickly forget that we, you know initially we say yes this is what we need to do and then we go back to you know our own tribe 
and focus on on our own little world so so uh what do you think an organization like ours can do some you know can do about that you know in, in continue to educate and and show um you know our supporters our staff uh, our partners that that we are in this together um yeah 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 i, I mean so i think there's so I mean, as I think of the goals, frankly, the goals for any one organization, especially, I would say, a medium-sized organization like ours, are overwhelming, right? We're not going to be able to be, you know, um, involved deeply in all the goals. So, so one of the things we have to do is just figure out where we can add the most value and then concentrate on that with the idea that somebody else is going to pick something else and do that. And so... So um, I think just for us as an organization, we just have to, I would say, find the ones that we feel resonate with, with, with who we are and our mission and, and do as much as we can in those areas, always keeping an eye to the larger interconnectivity of, of all of them. Great. I, I want to take you to... Um... I, I know you consider this is the most difficult question I'm, I'm asking you, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm asking it you anyway. Um, is is if yeah if I ask you to name a song or a piece of music that best embodies, according to you, what CWS is about? Yeah, which so song you, or piece of music will you pick and why? Okay, so so I, I've been struggling with this because, you know, I. <laughs> There's a lot of music I like, a lot of genres, a lot of bands, a lot of, a lot of things. So, so as I was just really thinking about it, you know, there's no kind of, there's a lot of songs that have pieces that really, really are good. And, and frankly, I, I think your next question, other than the song or piece of music is, what would your soundtrack to Search World Service be? So then you got to pick a whole album of music. So that gives us a little bit more. So I'm gonna. So I want to say one of the one of the songs I've always really loved. I, so so maybe I, I'll start by saying I was thinking, okay, artists. Which artists do I really feel resonant with and connected to, and do they speak to to us as an organization? So so you know I'm a I'm a product of the of of, of the Northeast of the United States. So Bruce Springsteen, of course, is one of my favorites. Um, and you know, I was thinking back uh, a couple of his different albums. Um, so uh, in the album "Darkness on the Edge of Town," there's a song called "Promised Land," and mm. you know, for me, you know, I think the the, the lyrics on that, it, it, just the refrain, you know, I believe in the promised land. And so for me, I think both it, it fits with CWS's faith-based nature of who we are, um, but I also think the different constituencies we help, uh, whether they be refugees coming to the U.S., whether they be people in the, the, the middle, uh, you know, being helped in an emergency, since the promised land is a metaphor for a better life, um, for, for getting to hopefully where you want to go, to being connected with something greater than yourself. I would say if you, had, if you forced me to pick one, uh, promised land, Bruce Springsteen, of course, I was thinking the other group I'm really kind of a big fan of is U2. So the song One um, was really just like, I think it talks about we were just talking about the interconnectivity of things. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that would have been my second. Great. Well, I, I, I can, you know, I can give you a, a, a remix of the two songs. So that's, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> um, hey, Rick, so, so you are, I think, a year in now. Or, or one and a half Just, yeah it's a little, going yeah. fast right so yeah, um, it's going fast. yeah. Um, how long do you see yourself doing this and and then at the end of the road and that's for all of mm. us ultimately you know so at some some point what do you hope that people will say about you when you know about the time that you were in charge of this organization I think for me, um, it's really funny. It's like, I think this idea always is I want wherever I go, if I stay at a place, if we go, like we go to a beach house as a family, um, or if we do something like my own house, like, uh, like when I, when I think we're going to move from here, I want the simple question for me, have I left it better than I received it? Mm. And so that could take a whole lot of different forms. Um, so if I feel like I've, um, if people say, he left it in better shape than he when he went there. Um, 
that will be the ultimate compliment compliment for me. Um, I don't I don't know what the, what success specifically looks like. You know, I, I think um, I think every um, uh, person who uh, sits in a CEO seat um, has a very I would say uh, just a, a, a unique vantage point and a, a unique set of calculations that they think about in terms of the organization. So, um, you know, I know uh, you, you interviewed Lonnie Turnipseed. Lonnie had a set of ways, and also he's receiving the organization in a very specific context in time in the organization's history, Rodney Page, and then, of course, um, uh, the Reverend John McCullough. Um, so all of them had a, a different challenge in front of them, a different external environment context. And so, you know, for me, I, I would say what I'm trying to do is trying to weatherize CWS to this new context that we're facing, to this new external environment that I think is changing far more rapidly than it had previously done. Um, and so uh, trying to also make us more um, in this space that we, we, we compete in very different ways. You know, I think the nonprofit sector, there's a lot of collaboration, which I think is fantastic, right? Um, but when I say competition, it's really about, there's also finite dollars out there. And so if we, I think we feel that we're doing uh, a great job in our areas of concentration and our mission, um, and that we wanna you know, get more funds to do that, that in fact, if you know, we have to be in that competitive space, whether it be the unrestricted or the restricted side, um, whether it be in people's hearts and minds or in technical solutions. Um, so, you know, just, for me, um, this idea that 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 CWS has to um, be ready for the unexpected, and maybe I'll share just a very personal note. You know what drove that home for me ultimately was, um, as you know, I was, you know, I was caught in the Haiti earthquake in 2010, and you know, I, I literally was uh, two steps away from death. Um, as you know, two of our colleagues who were with me that day, there were six of us. Two of them died um, in that experience. Um, and I could have been one of those very easily. And I remember the whole day that day, we were, we were in meetings with the Ministry of Health of, 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 of Haiti. We, we also had CDC. We were doing neglected tropical disease programs. And, you know, we just kind of broke from that meeting like we would break from any meeting. It's the end of the day. People are going off to do their things. People are going to have dinner. We were going to meet our Methodist colleagues. And then literally walking across the lobby, the earthquake struck and and you know, I was trapped under the ground for for basically you know over 55 hours, and was lucky to to be rescued. Could have easily not been rescued. Could have died at that moment, or could have not been rescued. So, so this idea that like none of us truly know what's around the corner. And so for me, that's true organizationally. We don't know what's around the CWS corner. So I'm just for me, my goal is to have CWS be ready for whatever's around that corner. Yes, no, th thanks uh, Rick for, for sharing that. Um, yeah, I, 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 I do would like to um, end with the question that I ask in my regular uh, podcast um, as well, and that is any last idea, um, question, advice, um, you know, for the listener? Um, you know, I think, I think uh, I'm always, ex even, even though there's a lot of challenges, I think the external environment has been really rough whether it be essentially nonstop uh, natural disasters, whether it be complex emergencies um, around the corner that you don't predict like Ukraine. Um, uh, I think there's hope. And I think organizations like Church World Service uh, really make a difference and, and, and allow people to express that hope. And so I, I'm just really, I feel really blessed um, with, with where I am right now and the opportunity to be the CEO of uh, such a wonderful 
uh, historic organization. Um, and I think, you know, I would just say, if you believe that we can do more together, if you believe that we need to address hunger and poverty, displacement and disaster, and if you um, believe that, 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 that addressing, helping the most vulnerable populations is important, then, then, then join us, you know, that we are, we are doing this together and um, just, just or, or join something that you believe in and another organization, if it be it, but I'd rather you join ZWS, but another organization is also good, but, but there's a lot of hope still in the world and I don't want people to, to, to think otherwise. Great. Now, thanks, uh, Rick, for, for today. And, and um, yeah, no, and thanks for, to, for, for, the, for the conversation, but also, you know, allowing me to, to uh, have this podcast, this specific one uh, about CWS. And I, I think, you know, you and I talked about this. This is not only to, you know, to advertise uh, about the work of CWS, but I, I think the story of CWS is hopefully um you know also of use for people listening to it in terms of working in this sector or you know learning how organizations develop and how they grow continue to grow and what is necessary and how you do that and how you deal with it uh, my, my lesson so far is that uh, you know this clearly an organization is bigger than the individual i mean it's it's so you know and and often if not always, organization is is showing where it needs to go, which is really weird to say in a way, because we think like, you know, it's people that drives this. I often have the feeling that our organization is, is showing what needs to be done and, and uh, listening, what I've learned, you know, from you or from John McCullough or from Rodney or from Betty, you know, all those people that I've talked with is um, that they have similar stories, is that... Uh, you know, they're shown the way and, and this organization is bringing them. And uh, I, I think this organization can be proud and, and the people as well to, to what it has achieved so far. And, and uh, yeah, hopefully it's also inspiration for, for folks out there, as, as you said, um, you know, to contribute, to uh, realize that there is a lot you can do uh, to make this world a, a little bit better. And it doesn't have to be huge, um, you know, it can be relatively small and and but don't as underestimate small relatively small things is there is there anything i should have asked you rick <laughs> no 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 i think we covered it um <laughs> no appreciate it um no just really appreciate the time together thank you maurice okay great well good luck thanks do you see you do you see me Will you be the eyes so that we all can be? Thank you for listening to Walk, Talk, Listen. Please check us out on 100mile.org or follow us on Facebook or Instagram. And if you want to know more about Churchful Service, please go to cwsglobal.org.